Skyborn, Episode 3, Empathy and Enmity, by K.G. Lockrams. Our mother used to tell us that on their first wedding anniversary, our father said he wanted a divorce. This was not a surprising sentiment, given he had shoved her down the stairs when she was pregnant with her first child. When I was young, that story made me sad for her, but looking back as an adult, butterfly effects notwithstanding, I wish for both their sakes they had divorced. Would it have been so terrible not to have been born to these two people, bereft of empathy and healthy egos? Perhaps their lives would have been better had they broken free from one another then and there. I can't imagine our mother had any idea what she'd gotten herself into during their first year of marriage. She had relocated from her hometown to a new state with a military base culture. She had a newborn less than a year later and discovered her high school sweetheart turned husband was violent and cruel. She would have had no support system around her, and it is unlikely she would have confided anything about her situation to her older sister. She imagined her brother-in-law as the perfect husband and the one who got away, even though they had never dated. Our mother always had this feeling of entitlement toward him, which fueled a lifelong grudge against her sister, who she felt didn't deserve him. Our mother would often tell us of how her parents carried our aunt around on a pillow when they were children. If true, I've always imagined it had something to do with the loss of their second child before our mother was born. Our mother would say if that child hadn't died, she'd have never been conceived. Who's to say? One thing was certain. She clearly felt she was the one who belonged on that pillow. Our mother was not prepared for what became of the reality of her life. She came from a good home, was college educated, and lived in a time when the feminist movement and women's rights were just beginning. I imagine, had she called the police while living near the base, they wouldn't have been sympathetic to a domestic violence situation and would have treated it as some sort of private family matter. When they moved away from the base to the town I was raised in, I have no doubt the local police department would not have been any better, given the active Ku Klux Klan in our county. It was a time of toxic masculinity, women as chattel, and men ruled the roost. Our mother failed to protect us on multiple fronts. It's just a fact. She either didn't have the tools, ability, or interest, which is also just a fact. She didn't want to see or believe the sexual abuse. We were all physically abused, but her active participation in our emotional abuse, regardless of the circumstances, was a choice, and I wish she'd made a different one. As children often do, I thought the blame lay solely with me. I brought these things upon myself. I wasn't worth protecting. I wasn't lovable. My sister once told me that our mother had approached her parents about leaving our father and moving back home. The story goes that her father said she could come, but she could not bring her children. I never heard that story from our mother, and she loved positioning herself as a martyr. Look at what I sacrificed for you. Martyred victim was part of her coping strategy. She also had a long history of telling each of us slightly different versions of the same story, tailoring the details to each of us to try and get the most from each of us. She did her best to raise us as her emotional caregivers, and again, it was her coping strategy. The main reason I find this story difficult to believe is that her parents were kind and generous people. Our mother's father knew of his own wife's history of abuse as a child, both physically and sexually. They had the space for us. They disliked our father. It simply didn't add up for me. I'll never know for sure, and so part of me gives her the benefit of the doubt and some credit for making the attempt. Whether true or false, she was trapped, wounded in her own way, and like so many of us, didn't have the tools she needed in a difficult moment. She also lived in a time when they weren't easily obtained. These realities of her circumstances don't excuse her behavior. They don't absolve her. They're simply additional facets of her life and situation that I hold and examine alongside the others. The houses in our neighborhood were still being built by their original owners when our parents purchased, and so they were moving into an established and growing community and culture. They were welcomed into the neighborhood and forged a few friendships. Not long after our parents moved in, those original homeowners began to sell and move on with their lives. Some of the people who moved were friends of our parents, and their relationships survived the moves. As new people moved in, our parents never made friends with any of them. They benefited from being welcomed themselves and then closed the door behind them. One time, my mother had made a cake for a new family that moved in just down and across the street from us. They never returned her plate. That one event became for her an anchor for never again welcoming a new neighbor. 
When someone new would move in, I'd suggest we make something to welcome them to the neighborhood. Why? she'd ask. The hunters still haven't returned my plate. Those who had moved on and maintained a relationship with our parents became opportunities for us to have new adventures and broaden our worlds a bit as we'd get to travel and visit their new homes. When our parents' friends would come back to visit us, there was a spirit of genuine excitement in the air. They were bright spots of normalcy and happy anticipation. Whenever we had company, the whole house felt lighter. Our parents had a shared mission and purpose, and it let them get out of their own way regarding the troubles in their marriage. I think they entertained as a means of tolerating one another through distraction. It seemed we had a company for dinner or bridge club two or three times a month. When we'd see the house being cleaned, one of us would ask, Who's coming over? That question would drive our mother nuts. It's not that she kept a dirty house, but she only cleaned the whole house when we had company coming. We connected the two events, and so we always asked, Why does someone have to be coming over? Why can't I just be cleaning? She'd snap. Well, exactly. That's kind of the question. Our mother ran over our first family dog with a station wagon. He was a Dalmatian, and as is sometimes the case, he had a mean streak. He was also an escape artist, and our mother had no time for that. While driving around in the station wagon looking for him on one of his great escapes, he stepped into the road in front of her, and she ran him over. His side was torn open, and he had been taken to the vet who dressed the wound and closed the large flap of flesh at his rib cage. He was brought home, and after about two days, the wound flopped open. He must have chewed at his stitches. It was one of the most disturbing things I'd ever seen. Within a couple of days, he was gone. No, he didn't die, our mother assured us. We decided to take him to a farm. He'll be happier there and able to run all he wants. As many young children do, we embraced this lie as truth. Animals didn't fare well in our home in general. When I was a toddler, we had a parakeet that was kept in a cage atop the refrigerator. It was a biter and given the nickname Hostile Feathers. It was found dead in the cage one day. No one could remember the last time it had been alive. My parents would laugh recounting that story for years. My world was roughly one square mile of geography. To the east was the elementary school. To the south was one of the oldest U.S. highways. A road branched off and passed by two of the three entrances to our development, then continued down a hill bisecting two parks. A park to the west, with the Marigo wheel, and one to the east with small finger ponds for fishing and ice skating. The road then dead-ended with the town's main street not far from our church. The section of the park with the finger ponds extended quite far and curved around to tie into the northern boundary of our neighborhood, which was a young but large wooded area, abutting small farms and private properties not directly connected to our development. A popular part of our world was known as The Ditch, which was a large area of scrub between the elementary school and the highway, so named because the majority of it sat well above the field on which the school was built. There was a long, steep gully that separated it from the school, hence The Ditch. It was a mass of clay dirt, scrub trees, and wild brush. Paths had been worn into it by neighborhood kids on bicycles and motorbikes, and it served as the de facto hangout away from parents and other adults. Young kids would go to explore, build forts, and be kids. Older kids would go to hang out, smoke, or drink. The walls of the ditch were where you proved your mettle on your bicycle, racing at breakneck speed down the face of the tallest wall and up the shorter side and onto the school grounds. It was also riddled with what we all believed to be Native American arrowheads, which were magical when discovered, though probably just triangular rocks. The woods to the north had something the kids all called a cave, which we were forbidden to visit. It was little more than an oversized crevice that housed a large brown bat population, but it fueled imaginations. A stream ran through the woods, and there were summers spent looking for frogs, salamanders, box turtles, and general hiking and exploration. The downtown was economically depressed, but had a large and historic five and dime, several clothing and footwear shops, our church, among other churches the public library, a movie theater, the hospital, and our bank. Along the highway were liquor stores, motels, a diner, the drive-in, a tasty freeze, and eventually the town's first strip mall. My best friend from first through fifth grade was Mikey. Mikey was of average height with brown hair and eyes. His family moved into the corner house where my siblings and I had once waited for our father to come home from work. He went to Catholic school, and I to public. He had an older brother around my sister's age, and both an older and younger sister. His father was the first person I ever knew who worked from home. 
He made dental orthotics for the armed forces out of a lab in their basement. I was fascinated by the molds of strangers' mouths laid out on his workbench. Mikey's house, being on a corner lot, was a natural destination for the kids in the neighborhood. There were always games of kickball in the side yard as long as the weather and daylight allowed for it. His parents were tolerant of being a destination for the children in the neighborhood, and so we were often on their property. My sister came to have a crush on his brother for a time, which gave us both a mutual destination and reason to be together outside of our home. Mikey and I invented grand problems in the world around us that only we could solve with our wits and imaginations. They had a dog, and eventually we replaced the Dalmatian with a collie mix. Mikey and I would play with them in his fenced-in backyard. We'd ride our bikes together around the development and at the ditch. We explored the woods, and we'd play together for hours. I spent the night at his house many times. We'd play the lava game, where you couldn't touch the floor or you'd burst into flames. We listened to records and had the monster mash and the one-eyed, one-horned, flying purple people eater on an endless loop. We watched TV and played board games and cards. When I'd spend the night, his mom always made scratch breakfast the next morning. And if his family were going to a local fair, I'd be invited to come along. Mikey was the only friend of mine to have ever spent the night at my house as a young child. It was thankfully uneventful. His family was the first mirror to be held up to the reality of my own family. Whereas our parents had a dual narrative, one for the public and one for what went on in private, Mikey's family was what you saw was what you got, and it was good. His parents would bicker, his mother would fuss at everyone, but it felt different from our home. I never had to expend energy wondering what anyone in that family really meant or what their real motivations were. No one was ever left bleeding, and no one ever needed stitches. Just before they moved out the summer between 5th and 6th grade, Mikey and I had lunch together in their kitchen. There was a popular peanut butter spread at the time called Kugel, which was a mixture of peanut butter and other things. One combination was peanut butter and banana, and we loved it. We had just finished eating, and as I was leaving through the kitchen door, a few steps down from the kitchen to the driveway, he called out, Wait a sec! I turned, and he smashed a piece of bread slathered with banana kugel all over my face in glasses. I don't know why he did it. He wasn't a mean-spirited kid. He was doubled over laughing. I silently walked out the door and headed home. It didn't make any sense to me, and by the time I got home, I was fighting back tears. I was already upset to be losing my best friend and a second family. I felt betrayed. It was all too much to have such a random act of callousness come from such an unexpected source. It signaled the end of our friendship. Once he moved, we talked on the phone a couple of times, but as children, we never saw each other again. I still remember his phone number. When I was around five, my brother put me in the clothes dryer, turned it on, and tried to keep me from kicking the door open. There was a family dinner, either Thanksgiving or Christmas, when I was six and in the first grade. Our father was drunk. He rose from the dining room table, went through the kitchen to the foyer, opened the folding louvered closet doors, took out our mother's purse, returned to the kitchen, set the purse on the carving board, picked up the electric knife, and tried to cut her purse in half. It was unclear if out of malice or simple curiosity. As I've said, he lacked impulse control. I've heard this scenario on multiple TV shows over the years, told by characters my age who are sharing odd memories of their parents. Disgruntled spouses and electric knives clearly had a moment in 1970s American culture. When he was finished, he put the knife down, knelt on the kitchen floor in front of our collie mix, and began referring to it as God. He then proceeded to confide in God his profound dissatisfaction and disappointment with his family as we watched from the dining room. That dog and I were inseparable. He was one of those dogs with a capacity for empathy and was very engaged with both my sister and me. I'd take him everywhere I could. One afternoon when I was seven, I took him for a walk. As we passed the neighbor's house around the corner from us, their 16-year-old daughter came bounding out the front door, ran up to us, jumped in the air, and landed right in front of his muzzle. Startled, he went after her bell bottoms and broke her skin in the process. Her parents made us put him down for being violent. It was heartbreaking for my sister and me to lose something that gave us regular, unconditional love. She never forgave me. Both my brother and sister told me year after year from as early as I can remember, you're going to die before you're 21. I don't know where that came from, but it played on a loop in my head. Church on Sunday was a regular part of our lives. 
I believed in the Easter Bunny and Santa Claus, but never had a strong sense of God. I was an acolyte, sang in the youth choir, and attended Bible study because it was what my parents wanted. I was once locked in the supply closet at Sunday school for asking too many questions. We had the minister of our church over on occasion. We tithed. I said my prayers at night as I was taught to ask for God's blessing on those in the family who made the list, which was given to me by my mother. We said grace before dinners, our father's arsenal of condiments laid out before him. What a farce. Sitting in the pew beside my parents in my little polyester outfit, looking up at Christ on the cross, my reflections during Sunday service were, more often than not, what did he do to deserve that? I liked the music, the singing, the stained glass windows, and I especially enjoyed the quiet and the ritual. I found knowing exactly what was coming for almost a full hour once a week incredibly soothing. It was all right there in the program, down to what hymn would be sung and when. I took solace in the communal behavior control offered by the rituals of each service. I didn't get much else out of it. If anything, attending church deepened my awareness of the double messaging at home. My father pretending to be a Christian rather than actually living the teachings we were told mattered. Our county library operated something called a bookmobile. Each week during the summer, it would arrive for an hour or two, open its doors, and you could browse the selection they chose for that week, order a book from the countywide library system, and return books you'd finished. I can't remember a single book I read by name, but I was there as often as possible picking things up and taking things back. Reading offered me solace, escape, information, and insight. I fracked my brain trying to recall a time when my brother and I had ever gotten along, and there's nothing. Our father worked to separate us all from one another so we wouldn't unite against him, and sadly, he succeeded. We had no meaningful connection with each other. When I was of an age that I would have naturally looked up to my brother, he was my abuser, and I wanted nothing to do with him. My sister and I came closest to forming any kind of genuine bond, but it rose and fell. Memories of her shoving me down the steps are enmeshed with playing tea with her in the antique tea set someone had given her which she kept in a cardboard box wrapped in a soft, deep purple remnant from a bathroom rug. Memories of her tripping me coming out of the bathroom are tied to memories of doing ceramics together and Christmas caroling around the neighborhood. Memories of her shutting herself off from the family and hiding in her room are linked to memories of being in her room together, listening to 45s on her portable record player. Her bedroom evokes memories of sanctuary and trespass. I remember ice skating together on the water retention basin near the elementary school one winter. She protected me from being bullied by Jim's older brother who carried a grudge about being turned away for oral sex after the ice cream truck incident the preceding summer. This memory of her as my protector stands in contrast to her doing nothing the night my brother was beating my skull so hard with my hairbrush that it snapped in two. As an adult, I know she was doing the best she could to cope with her own battles with our parents, but the little boy in me that still carries these competing memories and emotional contexts finds it confusing. My sister was very smart and musically gifted. I admired her for both. We shared what we could as we could, and that's the best we had. We had a common interest in syndicated TV shows like Star Trek and The Big Valley. Though probably more accurately, we shared an attraction to William Shatner, Richard Long, Peter Breck, and Lee Majors. We both loved to watch classic movies and musicals. For years, we had a tradition of watching Jesus Christ Superstar on TV every Easter. We were familial frenemies, but for a time, when we were young, we found moments of kinship in the midst of the crazy and the violence. When I was six, our father built a garage behind the house to work on cars. While putting the shingles on the roof and knowing my fear of heights, he commanded me to climb up the old aluminum ladder leaning against it and join him. My brother, who was in the yard with me, had been begging to come up, and our father wouldn't let him. His demand that I climb up was equally about terrorizing me and denying my brother that which he clearly wanted. As I got to the top, the fly section of the ladder that was resting against the roof line snapped off. The ladder pitched suddenly and I was dropped a full story to the sun-baked ground below. I landed at the base of the foundation, flat on my back. The ladder clattered to the ground beside me. The force of the fall had stunned me to such a degree I couldn't move or draw a breath. I was terrified by this paralysis. All I could move were my eyes. I looked up and was exactly below my father, who was leaning over the edge, looking down at me, laughing. My brother, standing several feet away, followed suit. I lay there, unaided, until I could breathe on my own again. 
In third grade, we started music, which consisted of band and choir. The music teacher was a very heavy woman who would threaten to sit on you if you misbehaved. She was funny and patient, as she'd have to be. Our formal exposure to music began with white plastic recorders with red accents. The class was taught pitch, rhythm, counting, fingering, and the basics of the staff and how to read notes. One day, the teacher had us arrange our small plastic chairs into a large circle. She had an assortment of instruments next to her, and one by one, she passed them around. We got to try each one. The thinking was to look for natural ability. After so many people, she'd take the instrument back, spray the mouthpiece or reed with coconut or mint-flavored antiseptic, and put it back in circulation. The stuff was probably pure alcohol, but was delicious, especially the coconut flavor. Flutes, triangles, tambourines, clarinets, saxophones, trumpets, and other instruments suited to small hands were passed around. Although I wasn't able to make a sound with anything, somehow I landed on the trumpet, and for the next couple of days, I sat at home after school and would blow and blow until I cried in frustration that I couldn't make a sound other than my breath passing through the brass coils and out the bell. And then, just before dinner, I did it. I made the most god-awful sound I'd ever heard and was thrilled. Elroy and I became close the year the new school opened. We were both in third grade. He lived at the entrance to the neighborhood where the road branched off the main highway. I don't recall what his parents did. He was an only child and led what seemed to me to be an isolated life. The first time I met him, he was wearing shorts, and I asked him about his legs, which had enormous scars. I crawled behind the oven while it was on when I was a baby, he told me. I must have had a horrified look on my face. It's okay, he said. I was too young to remember it, and they don't hurt now. He was awkward around other kids, raw and wary. He was skinny, dark-haired, blue-eyed, deeply freckled, and quiet. He always seemed just a bit out of place, which I could relate to. Elroy was always himself and often a target for harassment or outright bullying. He knew he was different and didn't show any interest or ability in changing that. I admired him for it. The majority of my friends were boys, while Elroy had mostly girlfriends. At recess, he'd often be with the girls playing Chinese jump rope or whatever game was popular. It registered with me that he was somehow different, but it didn't alter how I thought of him. I didn't care. He was good-natured, smart, funny, introspective, and sincere. And I needed people around me who were the same on the outside as the inside. He had a strict home life. Something had happened to his birth father. I don't know if he had left or died. He never talked about it. By the time I met him, his mother was with another man, Rupert, and the three of them lived together. His mother was timid and shy like Elroy. Rupert was all swagger and bravado. He had no idea how to handle Elroy, and the dynamic between them gave Elroy and I a lot of common ground. Our friendship was very insular. When we would hang out together, it was usually inside at his house, as he wasn't allowed out much. I don't remember him ever coming to my home, and given his mannerisms, it was for the best. My family would not have been kind to him. I'd go over to his house, and we'd watch cartoons or play board games in his room. We played a lot of shoots and ladders. It was his favorite. We talked about what we thought of people in the world around us. And then, toward the end of fourth grade, he moved away. I can't point to any single moment between us that warranted our bond, but we bonded. We wrote letters to each other every week for almost a year after he moved. And then they stopped. While children, our mother would ask us what we wanted for our birthday dinner each year. I had become fixated on the dessert baked Alaska because my grandfather, the artist, had so many pieces of art that focused on Alaska. I asked for it every year for years. Running up to my ninth birthday, I waged an all-out campaign for it and my mother relented. Fine. I don't know what she did wrong, but the dessert ended up melting all over the oven. Happy birthday, she said. Now go clean the oven. She wasn't kidding. Although she'd continue to ask what I wanted for my birthday dinner each year, I stopped asking for anything. It was a trap. As soon as our parents knew what we truly wanted, it was highly unlikely we'd ever get it. Though my brother and I shared similar experiences at the hands of our father, the beatings, the mind games, the fear, the sexual abuse, we followed drastically different paths. I became introspective and kept trying for connections with the world around me. He became escapist and violent. He was given a toy bow and arrow one Christmas and shot our sister with it. He was the kind of kid who would light a firecracker, throw it at you, and then laugh when it exploded and you'd flinch. He used to use aerosol cans as impromptu flamethrowers. He once took a can of right guard underarm deodorant, a lighter, and torched the blue spruce in our front lawn. 
He made bazookas out of beer cans, accelerants, and tennis balls. He was once picked up by the police for shooting the windows of the local liquor store with a pellet gun from the shrubs of the ditch. And he'd physically attacked both my sister, my mother, and me, all by 10th grade. And he was just getting started. My path began with a question. Why? In the earliest days, I would ask, why is this happening to me? Why is my father so cruel? Why is my brother so cruel? Why is my sister so withdrawn? Why does my mother not see what's going on right in front of her? Why can't my mother make this stop? Why can't I make this stop? Why does my mother physically shove me away when I seek comfort? Why don't my parents love me? Why won't anyone protect me? All of these questions led to the one that encapsulates most of the damage done to me by my family. Why am I not lovable? Our father once said to us one Saturday morning, I've got a dollar amount in mind for each of you if you clean up the basement. And we jumped at the chance to earn some extra money. When we were finished, he said, I'll give you twice what I was going to give you if you straighten up the attic too. And so we rallied and spent the next few hours in the attic sweeping, organizing, cleaning the windows at either end. We presented ourselves at the end of the day to collect our money. He reached into his pants pocket, pulled out his hand, turned it over, opened his fingers, and revealed an empty palm. I was going to pay you nothing for the basement, and twice that is still nothing. He laughed. The nearest grocery store was one of the anchors of the strip mall built during the bicentennial. It sat along the four-lane highway, but in such a way that I could access it without having to cross the highway, and so was an approved destination for me, which meant I didn't have to ask permission to go. Behind the grocery store was a paved area for the dock. The rear of that section backed up to a wooded area with a dirt path which led to the park with the merry-go-wheel. I was on my bike and heading for the path. When I rounded the corner behind the store, there was a beat-up van idling with tattered curtains on the windows. A scruffy-looking man was walking back and forth along the perimeter of the wooded area. He saw me and started calling, Here, boy! Come here, boy! I slowed down, but my instinct said to keep my distance. He looked at me and said, Can you help me find my dog? He had me a dog. But my gut was giving me a strong danger signal. Where is he? I asked. I don't know. I let him out and he went into the brush over there. Can you see him? I turned to look where he pointed, and as I did, he grabbed the rear of my bike and pulled me toward him. Thankfully, he only managed to grab the reflector, which came off in his hand as I lurched forward. I stood up to put as much downward force as possible on my pedal and felt him grab the fabric at the back of my soft cotton shirt. He didn't get a full grip, and I was able to get away and crest the curb and speed down the path to the park. I didn't look back. I just kept pedaling. When I got home, I ran into the house to tell my mother what happened. Without turning around, she said, that's what you get for going to the mall without asking for permission. Our father loved his slides. As he became more proficient in his flying, he spent more time with his camera in hand, He'd take dozens and dozens of pictures, drop them off at the local photo mat, and have them developed as slides. I used to stop by the kiosk when out on my bike. The young woman who worked inside used to buy me a soda if I'd fetch her something from the nearby McDonald's, and we developed a friendship. Your father really likes his slides, she'd say. Whenever our parents would have company, he'd load up his Kodak carousels, and inevitably the screen and slide projector would be set up in the living room. Guests would be subjected to slide after slide of nothing but cloud pictures and blue skies projected onto the screen. They'd roll their eyes and make good-natured jibes as they patiently watched, feigning interest, and fidgeting with their drinks. I'd be in the foyer, peeking around the corner, taking it all in and loving every second of it. Our mother, before she re-entered the workforce, would occasionally bake cookies for us in the afternoon when we came home from school. She came to our recitals and school concerts. She fed us dressed us. She'd take us to the doctor when we were sick. But she didn't protect us, and like our father, positioned us against one another to serve whatever means she saw fit to serve. We truly were prisoners in their war. My brother was working on his escape, my sister built hers in her room, and I was doing my best to find my way. Our experiences from birth through fifth grade form the foundations upon which the rest of our lives are built. It's when we learn our templates of normalcy, Early in those years, our personalities are little more than reaction engines responding to the expectations placed upon us by those around us, and we're mirroring what we learn from parents, teachers, friends, ministers, and neighbors. Research has shown our biases and isms are formed by third grade. By fifth grade, 
we've received our sense of self and a rudimentary understanding of our place in the world around us. These first dozen years position us for future success, or lay before us the hurdles we overcome or hide behind for the rest of our lives. During those years, I was repeatedly given the message I was my father's property, to be used or abused however he saw fit. I was repeatedly shown by my family that I was not worth protecting or loving. The truth of my existence was ignored or flat out denied. I was voiceless and powerless within my home. I had no guidance for how to react to sexual abuse. There were no courses or check-ins at school, church, or Cub Scouts. The same can be said of my physical and emotional abuse. I had two visible nervous tics, but no one outside the home ever asked me if I was okay. I lived in a home that never felt safe, and I lived in a state of endless vigilance, braced for the next bad thing. Yet I had glimpses of better ways and better people, often enough to hint at a path in the world that was different from the one shown to me by my family. These glimpses allowed me to hope for a next good thing. The buoys in the water of my life kept me afloat whether I knew I'd encountered one or not. I was very fortunate in that way. I did my best to make sense of it all, as much as a child can. Humans have remarkably adaptive coping mechanisms. As I look back on the people I grew up with during those years, the basics of who they would be as adults were already there and solidifying. This one's rigid personality never changed. That one's constant need for attention never faded, though perhaps it was tempered by experience. This one's inherent mean spirit always drove their bus. That one's kindness never wavered. This one's drive saw them through to the goals they'd stated as early as third grade. I'm going to be a scientist. And she is. While that one's belief that fate would determine their course continues to careen through life. The cores of these young people were established. What was left was the fine-tuning, how the details of their experiences would hone or soften this or that aspect. There were a couple of surprises as life unfolded, but not many.